Earlier this year, a team of researchers did a pretty interesting survey where they asked people why they were signing up for a certain streaming service and what shows made them want to sign up. So the popular answer was not Succession. It wasn't Squid Game. It was... Well, most of the people who responded to this survey said the reason they signed up for a streaming service this year is because they wanted to watch this. That's right, The Office, a show about a tiny paper company in Scranton, Pennsylvania, a show that hasn't aired any new episodes since 2013. This is the show that is still dominating streaming services. And one of the stars of the show wanted to understand why. Brian Baumgartner is the actor who played Kevin, an accountant at Dunder Mifflin. He just published a book about the American version of the show. It's called Welcome to Dunder Mifflin. And I'm happy to say that Brian is on the uh, on the line with me now. How are you? What is happening? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm still... I got to get over the Kevinness of you. You know what I mean? Like, I have to get over that part of myself when I talk to you. <laughs> well, I used to, uh, you know, go in... Uh, it's changed a little bit now, but I when I used to go in... Uh, after the office ended and I would go in to a network of executives who, you know, allegedly at least work in entertainment and I would be pitching a new show, a new idea. And I would talk and I had sort of a standard bit where uh, about 90 seconds after I had started talking, I would stop and say, okay, guys, uh, I know you you haven't been listening to what I said. All you've been thinking in your mind is I don't sound like Kevin. So <laughs> let's get past that. Let's rewind. I'll start over. And uh, and that was sort of my standard introduction because, yeah, it, it is. Uh, some people get a little disarmed that I'm not the same. Yeah. Did it work? Did, 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 they, did they admit it? Did they it go was- like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, there was always a laugh. Well, I could see people's eyes glaze over like, oh, that's not how I expected him to be talking. And I know that they just weren't listening at all to what I'm saying, which is not unusual in normal life. But when I have something important to say, I want to make sure it gets registered. At least. <laughs> it's hard at the DMV. I get it. Um, yes. What went through your mind when you heard that little bit of the theme song? You know, I, this is so uh, well, you're asking me. It's a setup, but we didn't set this up. Yeah, it always does something to me now. Always. I mean, I can't hear it. There is um, a feeling of nostalgia that sort of comes over me just just hearing that that song. Um, That and I I truly almost can't listen anymore uh, to Creed Bratton sing All the Faces, which was the song he sang in the finale. And when he came in to talk to me for the book and the podcast, I had him sing it. I don't know why I did that to myself, but he started singing and just immediately, I'm not going to say full blubbering cry, but definitely misty eyes for sure. Why? Um, Because, well, there's a quote from the finale. Um, I'll probably paraphrase it incorrectly, but uh, Ed Helms character, Andy Bernard says, I wish, you know, you were in the good old days while it was happening. Yeah. Um, and that, that is, that is the feeling. I mean, I, I certainly knew how great it was, but to begin to think about that time and to go on this journey now that I've been on truly the last two years, um, this last two years is, is, uh, has been as rewarding and emotional for me than, than even when we were doing the show, being able to go back and and see my old friends and talk to my old friends and go through this sort of exploration um, has been a, a labor of absolute joy and love for me. And the reason you've been doing it is because, um, you, this is sort of how you set up the book, that it's a mystery. There's a, You're yeah. trying to solve a mystery. What is it about the enduring popularity of this show that you find so mysterious? Well, I think for me, it was, I mean, you referenced it, I thought beautifully in, uh, in, in your introduction there, because it's, it's shocking truly in a way, you know, you hear so much about squid game succession, uh, before that, what stranger things, all the sort of hot new hip shows. And the fact that we haven't filmed a scene in now eight years, 
um, that that it is the most watched show in television today is is mind boggling. I mean, we were uh, after early struggles for the greater part of our run, 10 years, nine seasons on NBC. We were the most watched scripted show that they had. We were the biggest scripted show that they had. But it really didn't compare to what has happened over the last five, six years, uh, this sort of um, incredible fandom following um, astronomical numbers um, is was confusing to me. And so really, I was approached about, you know, doing a podcast or, you know, something about the office. And for me, the question, as you said, is why? Why did this happen? How 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 did we get here? What were there clues early on in terms of the people that were hired, in terms of the casting, in terms of the director who came in to do the pilot, or Greg Daniels who created the show from the British version? Like what what happened? And so, yes, I I approached it. I was really into the true crime, the cliche. Yeah cliche asterisks here, but I was really into that sort of genre of podcast. And I was like, all right, well, what if it's not who killed who, or why is this person missing? But like, what if that's the mystery? Like, wh- why did this happen? How did this happen? And so going back and, and, and wanting to talk to everybody about why they think it is and, and illuminate a little bit, I think also there's a secondary thing for me that is just interesting. Um, all the people who watched it on streaming, obviously huge for years on Netflix and now Peacock or or wherever else. Yeah, and still still on Netflix it. in Canada, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I why people are um oh the people who watched it there, they weren't aware of of how sort of topical it was when it was happening, right? Or to give some insight into why the show maybe changed softening Michael Scott slash Steve Carell's character, making him a little, you know, he could still be terrible, but having moments of redemption in there and why those decisions were made. And so talking about some of those things for me, if watching the show would give a greater sort of perspective and appreciation of what they were watching, um, you know, Sabre, big corporation coming in. Well, that was the recession in the United States and big corporations were coming in and everybody was struggling. And so all of those things um, to me just makes, uh, makes it richer. Michael Imperioli, who played Christopher on The Sopranos, who also does a podcast about a yes. show and trying to uncover why it's injured to generations later. I had him on the show the other day, and he told me the story that the moment it kind of occurred to him that the show had reached this new generation that he couldn't quite understand was someone came up to him in the middle of a park. They were, He said they, there's no way they could have been born when The Sopranos debuted. Um, they lifted up their... Um, uh, pant leg and they had a tattoo of his face on on their shin do you have a moment like that where you went like oh wow i i do i i told this story in the book so if you're going to read it i apologize for the repeat but um it very clearly for me i was invited back to my high school to talk right so i had done theater and was involved there and you know, they, uh, I don't know, inducted me into the hall of fame or something. I go back and I was just going to do a Q and a sort of thinking for the theater students. I mean, I was aware at that point I was, I was known or whatever that people would be interested, but I walked back into this theater that I had performed in all those years of high school or whatever. And the place is packed. I mean, just like packed rafters packed, like, and I was like, Whoa, Okay. Um, and so the teacher starts asking me questions, whatever. And one of the questions was, what do you have a favorite episode? Standard question. Do you have a favorite episode? And I sort of have an answer that I give, which is true, but it's fairly standard. I usually mention a a, a few episodes and I said, well, there was an episode early on, uh, the second episode we ever did, uh, diversity day. And I said the words diversity day. And there was just like a wall of sound, like a wall of like recognition and sound that just came from, it appeared everyone in this theater. And I was, I was so struck. I was like, okay, 
these people, yeah, I mean, maybe they were three when we start when that episode aired, right? Or maybe not born. I didn't know exactly how old everyone was, but I was like, there's no way that they were around when this aired. And the fact that they know the episode before I've described one moment of it, they know the title of the episode. Um, that was like shocking and, and just crazy to me. So, so speaking of some of those favorite moments, we have this clip I wanted to play you where we sort of crowdsourced among our own office, our favorite Kevin moments to take a okay. look. Have you been introduced to Kevin? Which one's Kevin? In general, they do not give me much responsibility, but they do let me shred the company documents, and that is really all I need. If not Ashton Kutcher, it's Kevin Malone. I kind of know what it's like to be in commercials. My nickname in high school used to be Kool-Aid Man. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. It's a recipe passed down from Malone's for generations. It's probably the thing I do best. My favorite is the is the dead is the not dead dog, by the way. Okay, interesting. That that is a good that is a good one. My fa- I think one of I don't know why it's so obscure, but I remember laughing so hard saying it. Well, there were two, like in the talking heads, like the direct address the camera. The uh you can't eat cats. You can't eat cats, Kevin. Like him having to convince himself that that is true. And he says his own name. He says his own name. He needs to to remember it. There's a a story in the book, uh, Paul Lieberstein, who played Toby, who ended up running uh, the show toward, toward the end. He had a joke. I guess I was told later that he had pitched like year and everyone was like, no, that's too stupid. You can't do it. And I, I think Mike Schur, um, who ended up creating Parks and Rec or whatever, was a writer on the show. And he said the first episode that Paul ran, I think <laughs> he said this. I don't know if it's true. He put in the joke, which was him, uh, Kevin, doing the alphabet. And the idea that Kevin thought Elemento <laughs> was just one letter, <laughs> A, B, or whatever it was. Um, H, L, Elemento. Elemento. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Kevin's an interesting character too because I had we had Mike Schur on and whenever I get someone on to talk about anything if they've been tangentially related to the office I just ask him questions about them. we had um, a Chris Diamantopoulos on the other day the boom guy sure. from the we we and I just yeah. you know I talked to him too much about the office anyway point being is that there's a lot of like speculation um, about Kevin that he's you know he's a dumb guy he's a secret genius he's a money launderer He's yes. a spy for the government. Um, how do you see Kevin? Well, I'll actually share. A, a, I don't know if Mike shared it. So if he did, cut me off. I don't want to repeat a long story, but I, that was the big, like, um, what do you call it? Reddit thread. I think there's like, I don't know, thousands and thousands of threads about Kevin being a secret genius and all these this evidence that, you know, he embezzled from the company and it all sort of ends with because he gets fired and suddenly he owns a bar. So he's accumulated this money. So I'm sure it's going to come out at some point because we shot this story, excuse me, the season finale, which I think was like an hour and 45 minutes or something when it aired, it was already so long and there was still so many more things. Kevin had a storyline very quickly that, um, which came from partly from my experience. Uh, Kevin is just has nothing to do with me, but Kevin as a character is someone that people love. They want to, they want to touch, unfortunately, Um, (laughs) or they, when I, I can't go into a bar and not be offered drinks that people want to have a drink with Kevin Malone. It's not about it's Kevin Malone. And so we were sort of talking about how the show was going to end. And there was the idea of him being fired and what would happen. And, you know, talk to Greg Daniels and some of the writers just about like my experience or whatever. And and they had all seen it. So the idea in the finale was once the fictional documentary airs, right, that the camera crew has been filming all of these years and it airs on the PBS station, Kevin becomes a fan favorite. 
And the storyline in the show is that he becomes such a fan favorite and there's t-shirts. I have t-shirts in my office that were from the show that were like Kevin and all, like my face. There were all these cartoons and memes that they had created. Um, so in the finale, um, every, he went to a local bar and every time he went into the bar, people bought him drinks. And the, the story is, is that he had accumulated such a credit at this bar from people buying him drinks that he leveraged that. Basically, they were like, well, we have to give you ownership or at least part ownership of this bar because so many people have bought you drinks that you haven't been able to drink. And that is how in the story of The Office that Kevin actually gets the bar. And then it was a story so tangential to the wedding and there was the talk back, all the stuff that happened. They were like, yeah, we have to cut this for time, but it exists somewhere. I'm sure on Peacock, they'll roll it out at some point. Oh, this is blowing my mind. You just made a, like thousands of nerds very, very happy. <laughs> just just in that second, you know? Yes. It's amazing that your life can change on something so small. You know, like I know one of the, the, the audition process part of the book is part I really liked. And you, I mean, you could have easily been Stanley. Like you went for Stanley, right? Like, right. Isn't that, isn't that incredible that, and, and they were looking for unknown actors and they yes. were looking for people who were quote, Scranton hot. Right. Which means, right. which means. <laughs> right. Well, I don't, I'm not Scranton hot. I, I mean, that that really was about, um, you know, the I mean, now John Krasinski, you just said you had him on. He's a big, super hottie. He's now Jack Ryan. But you think back in the day, like he's a good looking guy, yeah. but he's not like Brad Pitt. Now, maybe he is Brad Pitt. He's maybe transformed himself into being Brad Pitt or Clooney or whatever. Um, but yeah, so they but the, yes, to your point, they were looking for unknown people and. Yeah, it is. I don't that this is such an obscure reference, but that that movie Sliding Doors. I think about that. Michael Keaton. I know it's Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, it, where basically this I don't know why I'm telling this story. Yeah, come on, let's do it over here. The mo the the in a subway station, it's been a while, but the idea is in a subway station, about to jump on a subway and the doors close, right? Those are the sliding doors and examines what would have happened if you got on or if you were locked out right behind those those sliding doors this is not an original idea i just always think about it in terms of that movie and i think about it in terms of my journey on the show yeah like if allison jones says ah, i'm too busy to meet this new guy today i'm never on the show they like you said they cast me as stanley one of my favorite piece of memorabilia i have allison when steve carell left the show he, uh, he, we had a party and Allison Jones, the casting director was there and she kind of came to me and she was like, you know, I was looking for some cool stuff to give to Steve. Cause she's like a pack. She keeps everything, like every note that she's taken on every actor throughout all of time. Um, she goes, I didn't really find anything, but I found this. And she handed me a piece of paper clearly from, you know, 10 years before. And it had three names it said, Kevin, this was like the finals list. And it was myself uh eric stone street for modern on, family yeah modern family yeah and jorge garcia who ended up on lost and other things so that's like this weird slide you know does that mean that i would have been on modern family i don't know you know who knows or the guy on lost or who you know whatever but yeah that that weird it worked out i think for everybody so i don't you know there was no harm no foul but yeah i mean that kind of crazy stuff and that happened a lot throughout the show i'll also add and that there wouldn't be a modern family if it wasn't for the office given the documentary style that was sort of pioneered you know on on the office um can i i want to play something that not from the show take a listen to this sure you should enter it in festivals or carnivals well that's pretty good reaction that's pretty cool right <laughs> brian baumgartner is my guest from the Office, where he played Kevin, he has a new book out called Welcome to Dunder Mifflin. What are we listening to? My Strange Addiction, Billie Eilish. Uh, Billie Eilish's song. That's a funny story, at least to me. Makes me feel like an idiot. Although I think the whole world was in the same place. It's hard to rewind. But I, I feel like it was in the summer of whatever, three, four years ago. 
And um, we get a call. Um, my manager gets a call. It says, hey, there's this uh, artist, Billy Eilish, I think. She wants to use your voice in a song. I was like, who, who is that? What, I don't, I, oh, oh, what's the deal? And yeah, there, she's, I guess she's a big office fan. And so she wants to use some of, uh, you know, of your voices of the song. And there was six or seven of us, five, six, seven. I don't remember how many, but I remember Steve Carell. He said, I said, who are they asking? It was like, you know, John and BJ and Steve and whatever. And I was busy or distracted or whatever. And I was like, whatever Steve says, if Steve says yes, then okay. If Steve says no, then no, whatever. So Steve said, yes, our voice. And then like, I don't know, it felt like three months later, she becomes this global phenomenon. I'm hearing this song on the, on the, on the radio, like every day. It's crazy. I got to speak to her for this process. We've been on as sort of a, a super fan of the show. And it's so interesting and, and really I liked using her voice because she echoes a ton of sentiments that I get on the street, in the airport, in a restaurant, wherever, but that for her, the show brings her comfort and she puts it on. Even if she says, even if uh, she's not watching it, she just has it on playing. She's doing other things. And because she said, I, I know what the scenes look like. I just want to hear the voices and, and bring myself back there to the show and and to Dunder Mifflin. Well, I, I want to talk to you a bit more about that in just a second, but that Billie Eilish to me is sort of the answer to the question we asked at the beginning, the mystery of why this show has endured. And in particular, the mystery of why people who weren't born when the show went on the air. I remember talking to John Krasinski and he was like, yeah, we were the sort of the original downloadable show like the ipod video show but even our fans don't even remember that you know like there are fans right. who have no knowledge of the show when it aired on tv as you mentioned before specifically gen z largely a generation that has not worked in an office yet either yes what why well look i think that and we do a lot of discussion about this in the book um we go to looking at truly like the history of comedy and where the characters came from, the archetypes of the character. I mean, on that level, these characters have endured forever. Yeah. You know, Kevin is the clown and Dwight is the clown and, and, and you have the lovers and you have uh, the King and you have, you know, the bumbling King. And so, I mean, in that regard, then you bring in cringe comedy, which is something relatively new you bring in sort of a British cringe comedy as well. And really it's the first comedy um, that takes place in an era where reality shows were starting in the United States. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of conversation about that, that the style, the moving, the camera that moves around and is a little bit jittery and is filming reactions to different things. That's about now people with iPhones that film everything and their friends and that sort of that sort of homemade style um i think is really popular i also think that um because look we were making a show we thought we were making a show for people who worked in offices that is definitively true they're the ones who will relate a um as kevin riley the head of nbc at the time said the office comedy is a staple of network television so it's like look if there's 200 million people who work in offices in the United States alone, if 10% watch, it's a huge hit. 5% watch, it's still a hit. Like we're, we're good. Um, but I think that the parallel in this environment of, of us being stuck, literally sealed into a room with no movable walls where the camera is moving around all the time, you felt that the, the architecture of the place closing in on all of these people and, and characters and the, the parallel between an unreasonable boss making his employees do unreasonable things while they sit next to people they don't choose to sit next to year after year, the parallel between that and an unreasonable teacher who makes their students do unreasonable things while sitting next to people they don't choose to for year after year, that parallel I think is really, really clear. That makes a lot of sense to me in terms of 
the interactions between the characters and how you don't have to work in an office to get the, those interactions. Um, I, I, I want to go back to what you said earlier about Billy Eilish telling you that the show is a comfort. Um, I, I guess I'll, I, I'm trying to figure out whether I was going to say this, but I'll say it. So uh, when I was 24, so that would be 10 years ago. What year is it now? 2021. So that would have been 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad died and, uh, you know, it was cancer. So it was pretty quick, you know, it was from diagnosis to, to death. And I remember, I mean, I was so sad. Like, I remember feeling like this is, I didn't really know what depression was, but I saw what like deep bleakness felt like and in the only way I, I was staying upstairs uh, at my, my parents house and the, my grandmother's old tv which was one of those tvs with the cabinets still in it uh yeah. was there you know and i hooked up my xbox 360 to the tv and just to try and get through the day i would put the office on so right off the bat i i i owe you a debt of gratitude for that but I, I'm guessing it's not the only time you're hearing stories like these, you know? It's, um, well, first of all, thank you. I, I tell everyone who tells me a story like that, thank you um, for sharing. Uh, I'm obviously sorry that you had to go through that. It's, um, to me, it's the greatest gift that I've been given uh, out of the show is is knowing and hearing from people that the show uh, helped in a time that they needed it. I was just told a story from a woman who um, was is the spouse of uh, one someone who serves in the military, and they were uh, stationed in South Korea fairly recently. And she was in South Korea, and she got some sort of I, I, she didn't go into detail exactly what was going on, but some sort of very intense. Um, gastrointestinal, some sort of sickness issue. And it told me eventually had to be air vacked or whatever out um, and brought back to the United States. Um, but she told me about laying in a South Korean hospital with people, many of whom didn't speak very English very well, uh, nurses, Um, And they would sit around and she would watch the office just to try to find herself through this experience. And she's talking to me. This was in person. She's holding her side. And I'm so I'm thinking like, oh, she's still like she's really not good. And I said, you know, are you are you? And she goes, oh, no, I'm I'm fully recovered or whatever. And I said, oh, because you're you're holding. And she said, "Um, two days ago, I broke my rib my ribs and um my husband is is stationed away again so this and she turns she goes this is my um this is my mother-in-law who traveled down to be with me because i had to come and see you and tell you this story and thank you for the show and that's just like t- i mean it your story as well it just takes my breath away like how, how do i even we were just a gaggle of idiots trying to make people laugh right i mean for a decade but the idea that that um has that the show has meant something or helped somebody through a difficult time um, is no, I mean, it's a, it's an amazing gift. That's, that's, I consider given, given to me and enriches my life and existence. So again, thank you. Oh, you, you, and thank you. True truth and beauty. I mean, that's what Greg Daniels talks about in the show. And maybe that's a good way to close this off. Like talk to me a little bit about the show, the office, this, comedy show by a bunch of idiots <laughs> right. in right. the context of truth and beauty. Right. And by the way, I, I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say on Canadian. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. You're, you're Kevin. Now, you can do whatever you want. So Ke- Ben Silverman, one of our other producers, I, you know, I'll try to give a really erudite answer and then he'll just go like, yeah, but it's fucking funny. Yeah. Like that. Like, he, like he's, he also just says that. So I think that there is, I think that it is. And by the way, I, I watched it recently as I've been on this exploration and I feel like it holds up and I feel like it's really funny. But uh, to your point, Greg Daniels, um, the, 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 would, the adapter of the yes, British office the, to American audiences. That's right. The yeah. creator of, of our version of the show. Um, he, he talked about truth and beauty and 
truth and beauty, truth and beauty. And our director of photography said it was like he was a little robot walking around saying truth and beauty. You got to find the truth and beauty. And I said, well, what is what does that mean? And Mike Schur, actually, who was on your show, he he told me a story that Greg said to him. He was like, imagine Dunder Mifflin as a, an endless parking lot that goes on as far as the eye can see. And there's just space after space after space. And sometimes the lines are kind of faded and, you know, the concrete is cracked in spots, but it goes on forever. This endless asphalt wasteland parking lot. And he said, but if you look close enough, you begin to see cracks in the pavement and, and out of some of those cracks will sprout a tiny flower. And if you find that beautiful thing within that environment, that's what we're looking for on the show. And <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the ways that we end the book, and we talk about its legacy and stuff, but I, I asked everyone that I talked to, and we had over 100 hours of recorded interviews with everybody. One of the things I asked everybody was um, to respond to the last line of the show, the finale that was written by Greg Daniels. And it's Pam's character um, asking the, the question is, well, I don't, why, why did they choose to make a documentary about the people at Dunder Mifflin? And she says, I don't know. She said, but I think um, there's beauty in ordinary things. Isn't that kind of the point? And I think for Greg, that was the point. And I think that that idea that it doesn't, you don't have to be a Kardashian to be, uh, to have value, to be viewed on television or whatever. You, the ordinary people have incredible beauty and, uh, and, and examining that and maybe that feeling for people um, when they're down, maybe that, that feeling of hope or positivity um, is, is, is what comes through. Congratulations on the book and thank you so much for the show and, and for your time. Thanks so much. I really appreciate talking to you.